Hi everybody. Uh, welcome to Catering, uh, Chapter 8 in your book, How Can We Serve You? Well, I think we all realize services, or should realize, service is the most important thing we do in the hospitality business. I mean, hence the name hospitality business, not necessarily food business or, or catered food business. I think sometimes people forget about how important the, the hospitality part is. A number of people that come to me and say, oh, I make great this or make great that. Uh, they don't even think about anything else, and they're, they're always amazed when their restaurants don't do well. It's because they forget the service aspect of it. Um, and I think that's even more important when we talk about catering, for example. Because in a catering environment, people are paying for a certain feeling. They're paying to be taken care of in a certain way, I think, much more than when someone comes into a restaurant. I think restaurants tend to be a little bit more about the food, but I think catering operations are really about service and those extra things that the caterer does. So, we talked last week about uh, the event planner and basically what the event planner does, who that person is. And they're like the quarterback, if you remember. They're the person that has the vision to put uh, all the pieces together to make a great event. Uh, from the food to the service to the decor to the entertainment and all those little things that go into it. It's a tough job. It's one that requires a, an immense amount of organization, creativity, being able to work with people, time management, just a whole lot of things go into that. Uh, but they're not alone. So there are some other jobs that go into the whole service side of it that we're, we're going to touch on real quick. Um, first one is an expediter or food handler. Um, that's the person that's going to stand there and make sure that everything goes out from a food standpoint that's perfect. It's that last person that checks the food before it leaves the kitchen and goes out to the diner. You might see this person in a restaurant setting. It's that person that stands behind the line uh, and is going, I need three fish, I need three chicken, and then they're checking the plates before it goes out. And we would use somebody like that in the catering operation just, uh, just like we would a restaurant. A maitre d' hotel uh, person is in charge of the dining room setup. All right, they're going to make sure the room is set up right, tables are set right, proper number of chairs, if we've got name tags, that they're in the right place. Basically, the, the person who's in charge of the dining room. Next, we have the captain. And the captain, they're in charge of specific areas of the dining room. So, for example, when we do a gala here, we may have 250 seats. Uh, and while I have one person over the whole area, I'm going to have to break that down into smaller sections to make it manageable from a service standpoint. So what we do is we'll break that 250 down into five sections of 50. And I'll have five captains. And each captain is solely responsible for their area, making sure their area is bussed properly, making sure their area gets their food properly. And if there's a problem in their area, they handle it. It's so much better than one person trying to watch 250 people all at once. A sommelier, uh, another person we might use in the catering business, and a sommelier is in charge of wine. Uh, purchasing wine, probably, selecting wine for sure, pairing food and wine, having tastings out with clients. Um, usually that's just not somebody who likes wine, but somebody who has studied wine, uh, has been around the business for a long time. Uh, some of these can make amazing amounts of money um, and they're in high demand. Other people, wait persons, bussers, runners, all go into having a good event. Um, you can't just have anybody out there taking tables uh, or cleaning tables off and taking plates away. I think in a catering operation, everybody has to be at a certain level. They have to have the right smile, the right look, the right confidence because those people are all making a statement. They're not hidden back away in the restaurant like they might in a regular restaurant situation. They're out front with the people. You might also have bartenders, uh, which are very important for these events um, because liquor tends to make a lot of money. And then set up crews, uh, maybe even break down and clean up crews. You know, there's nothing we hate more after an entire day of planning and putting on an event to have to stick around till 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night cleaning things up. So having a dedicated cleanup crew can be a wonderful thing. So let's talk about the basics of service a little bit. Um, if you've ever been in a restaurant, um, 
around, especially in our general area, you've probably seen all different types of, of service. People popping things down from all sides. Um, an amazing amount of, of horrible, horrible things. But there are some basics we try to, to live by. Um, basically, when we serve a plated meal, all right, in other words, we're going to bring a plate of food out to somebody, we're going to serve from the left and remove or clear from the right uh, for their entree. So basically, we come in, we put the plate down on the left, and then we remove dirty things from the right. Um, now, soup, beverages, we also serve that from the left, all right? It's almost pretty much general. Some people will go ahead and, and do it different, but we're just talking technically what is the right way to do it. Um, now, if you're going to put new glasses on the table or new silverware, say somebody has dropped something or they need new glass, put that on the table from the right. Always serve the women first, all right? If you've got a group with uh, one woman and four men, Go ahead and put your uh, your woman's food out there first. Uh, it gets tricky when you've got very important people at the table, um, but I always uh, follow protocol. Um, and once you have the, the women's uh, food down, then you can start, I go by level of importance. So if I've got a president of a college, I typically will serve them next, and then on down uh, the way. Always try to go beside. Don't uh, ever reach across the gas when you're going to put something down. Uh, try to be less uh, obtrusive as possible. There was a time years ago I was at a restaurant and uh, the server came by and, and literally while I was eating, uh, fork in hand, the server came by and picked up my plate, picked it up off the table, uh, dusted and crumbed underneath my plate, and then put the plate back down right in front of me, never said a word, and then walked off. It was a, an Asian restaurant where I don't think they had taught proper service. Um, so try not to get in your guest way and try not to be a, a pest about it. Now, let's talk about styles of service. We just alluded to one, and that's the American style service. That's where back in the kitchen we put a bunch of stuff on a plate. We take that plate out and we sit down in front of a guest. Um, we might have one table as a server, or we might have multiple tables. We might bring the food out on trays, and then the server puts it down in front of the guest. Basically, just remember for American service, things are plated in the back and then brought out. Um, butler passed service. That's where we'll have individual food plated and put on trays and then passed around for people to, to serve themselves. And we've all seen that fancy cocktail parties type of thing. Um, that happens a lot. Russian service, large platters are, are brought out and then the guest serves themselves off of it. You don't see Russian service very often. I think people are afraid of, of pouring things on other people. Your server comes out with a plate of uh, uh, meat and they have to hold that and serve you at the same time. I think it's very classy. Um, but uh, also you have to have servers with a certain amount of skill. I mean, let's face it, you couldn't just have anybody do that type of work. Uh, you'd also have to have a server per table. Um, otherwise, if you have a very large group, you would not be able to get everybody served in time. It's good to think about each one of these types of service have advantages and they all have disadvantages too. Um, so when you're planning an event, uh, you have to think about all, all the different things that go into it before you suggest one of these, just because you think it'd be cool. Um, English service, similar to family style, but the host serves everyone. Think about this as the old-fashioned dad sitting at the head of the table. Mom brings out the, the platter of food, hands it to dad. Dad says, hand me your plate. He plops food on your plate. Everybody's happy. Um, once again, we don't see that one very often in our line of work in the catering business, just because usually events we're doing are very big. Now, kind of alluded to this family style. I'm sure most of you have been to a family style restaurant. That's where they bring a big bowl out. And unlike English service and family style, you get the bowl passed to you, you put food on your plate and pass it around. Uh, probably for most people, it's a traditional Thanksgiving type of service is family style. Now, you think, well, I've never seen that in the restaurant, but it, there's some actually great restaurants out there. Buca di Peppo, if you ever look that up, is a really pretty big Italian restaurant chain. And they're all about family style service. Big bowls, you take it, you pass it around. 
uh, for the right operation catering, if it maybe is less formal, the event you're doing, family style might be a perfect way to serve food. French service. Items are cooked in front of the guest. Um, there's a couple classic dishes when you when you see French service. Um, bananas foster, for example. Um, server brings out a cart called a griodon. Buyer uh, puts in some bananas, puts in uh, butter, puts in brown sugar, uh, hits it with some banana liqueur uh, and some rum, lights it on fire, everybody goes, yay, and then they pour it on ice cream. So French service. Um, obviously you can think of a few issues with French service, I, I'm sure. Um, setting things on fire is not as popular as it used to be, mainly because of a liability issue. You've got to have a pretty well-trained server to go out and set food on fire right in front of a guest. Um, you also have the liability and issues that go along with that. You don't see that so much anymore. We did it years ago at a school, but what we did was we set a separate station up in a corner of a room. And so when someone ordered, it was a Saganaki, a flaming Greek cheese. When someone ordered it, the server would go over to the cheese station and tell them we fire an order of cheese, uh, literally, and we would flame it over in a corner where we had fire extinguishers and everything. And people could still see the show, but it was in a much safer environment. So while it's cool to see, you got to watch out for things like that. Um, another type is the synchronized, and that's where everybody, uh, every table will have multiple servers. In fact, the server for each person or a server for each two people. The servers all bring out a plate of food and they all set it down at the same time. The synchronized swimming of the catering business. So once again, if you couldn't do that, more than likely, if you were doing a group of 250 people for dinner, where are you going to get 250 servers with the skill? You can only imagine what the cost would be. But a private dinner party for 10 people, very possible. Five servers to go out, each with a plate in hand. That could easily be done. Um, coordinating service. What goes into the perfect event? Well, we've talked about a lot of things uh, here recently. Um, food, service, set of staff, linens. Um, what goes into getting all those things put together? As you start to plan your, your catering projects, uh, which is basically putting event all together, you've obviously got to think about all these different things. Uh, the right linens for the right type of food, the right type of service for the right type of food. Do I even need linens? If I'm doing an outdoor barbecue for 500 people, you really think linens are important? Maybe we're all on picnic tables. Maybe we've had to rent plastic six-foot tables to take out there, but I really don't want linen. It, it's an outdoor thing. It's barbecue sauce. Maybe I can get by with some type of plastic red and white checkerboard on there. So you've got to really think when you're putting these things together what is going to give you the best service, what is going to meet the needs of the client uh, in the best way. You're going to have to make checklists for everything. Um, people say, how do you keep organized? I mean, I like whiteboards. I like big whiteboards everywhere and I write everything down I can on a whiteboard, every little detail because in a good catering event there's so many little things that go on. If you don't write these down, you're going to get lost and you're going to forget things. So it's real important that we keep these things all together. We're doing an event here um, coming up real soon where the client came up and said, well, we've planned for black tablecloths. We've already bought seat covers in white and we want black tablecloths. Well, for the number that they wanted, we called our supplier and our supplier said, we don't have black tablecloths uh, in that number. So once again, it, it's really good to get ahead of these things and make sure that your clients know that there are limitations on, on what they want, uh, potentially. All right, next I want to talk about buffets. Uh, we let, kind of went through a style of service. Another one I left off because I wanted to save it to the end was a buffet. Uh, we've all been to buffets before. Um, we've been to that Chinese buffet, you know, the one where people come out and dump fresh food on top of uh, old food, horrible things like that. And I'm sure we've been to some type of a catering out there uh, where we walk through a buffet line. Food uh, sitting out, 
self-serve typically sometimes we might be serving it um, sometimes it's hot sometimes it's as simple as a cold deli bar all right or deli meats and sandwiches and cheese and condiments and things like that but think of a buffet as just as kind of the the self-serve of the the catering world you know just like the other styles of service there are pluses and minuses to buffets um, and there's a bunch of them uh, advantages to it you put the food out you let people come uh, you'd sit back and wait so you can do a whole lot of people for you know with a, a small amount of labor and that's really nice um, labor cost being what it is if I can feed 500 people and I only need an extra three or four staff that's good um, buffets are great for drop-offs you can use disposable um, shafers which are those hot containers you put your food in and they keep food hot. Um, I can buy ten dollar disposable shavers, I add those into the bill, I can drop food off at a place and I can leave it. I don't even have to worry about service. Um, so buffets are great for that type of thing. You can also usually charge a premium amount of money um, over what you might for other buffet or other types of service I think. Um, because people are going to get more of a variety. In other words, if I'm doing a, a regular wedding um, and they either want the steak or they want the chicken or they want the fish, or if I do a buffet, I can put out beef, chicken, and fish, all three, and charge a premium price for it. On the downside to buffets, you've really got to worry about, you know, do you have enough food? And you've got to be really good about planning how much food you're going to need. And a lot of that comes from knowing your market. If you're doing a buffet for a little old ladies group like the Red Hats, um, you know they're not going to eat that much food. Conversely, if you're doing something for the college uh, football team, you've got to plan a, a lot differently. Buffets can also be difficult if you're one of those chefs or, or, or hospitality people that want to be an artist. Now, hey, can you make some good buffet setups? You sure can. But do you ever reach that level of that beautiful handcrafted um, individual plate? It's pretty hard, although I've seen some great buffets. Um, today when you look at your videos, you're going to see I put I think, three different videos just on buffet setup and, and, and looks of different buffets. And there's some pretty good looking things on there I, I think you're going to like. Um, from a guest standpoint, they like buffets. Once the food is out, I can self-serve. I can eat as much as I want. If I don't want beef, I can eat chicken. If I don't want chicken, I can eat the fish. And so there's a lot of pluses to the uh, to the buffet from that side. There's a whole lot, um, like I said in the videos that I put out today, there's a whole lot to buffet set up. Um, uh, once again, it has to go with the type of event you're doing, what type of plates, what type of land, and what type of setup. But there's some generalities on buffet setup that I think you should remember. Um, I think a great buffet, you'll notice from some of the examples, should not be one level. In other words, if you go to a place and all the, the food services just, or all the food items are just laid out on a table, one flat, straight line, um, I don't think the caterer has done their job there. Uh, I like buffets that offer a real visual landscape. In other words, something's high, something's low. Um, and what you'll see in some of these videos where we've used like boxes of, of cereal and put underneath tablecloth on top, we like to raise things up. You like to make it interesting. You know, that's how we get away from making that really pretty plate with all its different heights and levels and structures and colors and such. We try to do the same thing with a buffet. I like to have a focal point in a buffet, um, and so I like to have one big, like a um, either a large plant or a pillar or something, a focal point, and then kind of cascade down from that. All I've done those that are high, low, high, low, and, and all around. Think about your color when you're putting on that. Try not to do all the same color. Be very diverse with it. Make it as visually entertaining as you can. Um, so height, color, very important. Uh, if you're doing, say, three different types of tossed salad, don't put them right next to each other, all right? Space those out a little bit and make them a little bit more attractive. Use fun dishes. Use whimsical platters. Use interesting uh, 
uh, display methods to make these even look more interesting all the time. You know, around Halloween you'll see things inside of pumpkins. You know, where we cleaned a pumpkin out, hollowed it out, lined it to make sure it's, you know, okay to eat out of, and piled things inside of that. Whatever. Uh, years ago I did a, um, uh, a catering for a vegetarian chef that came to our college, very well known from the East Coast. So I did a garden party. Um, and I used flower pots, you know, the, uh, the the brown, cheap old brown flower pots, and the the little trays go underneath them. And I put all of the food basically on those and made it look like a big garden with all the vegetarian food. Um, so try to be creative with that. Um, the other thing when you're saying a buffet, we mentioned linens here. Um, I I've seen all different types of linen. Some people will use skirting, and skirting is basically kind of a fancy pleated uh, tablecloth that will wrap around the table. I'm not a big fan of skirting because I think it really is old and dated, and you know, I think there's some pictures of it in the videos that I, I put on. Uh, you have to care for it different, you have to hang it different, you have to wash it different. Me, I'm a big fan of cheap tablecloths. I like what we call the scrunchie. And with a scrunchie, I'll put tablecloths hanging over both sides of the table um, until it basically reaches the floor. And then I'll put another tablecloth going down the top. And I'll just kind of scrunch that up, uh, make it look a little bit disheveled, not, so it's not nice and flat. And the reason I do that is on a buffet is people are spilling food on it. What I can do is I can go ahead and clean that food up, but then I just kind of pull one of the scrunchy areas over the other and I cover it up. So I, I think it makes it easier to use. Um, fortunately, I, I, the, the skirting thing is kind of dying out. We don't see it so much anymore even though some people still ask for it. On the topic of linens, we've got the old buy or, or, or rent uh, type of thing. Um, buying costs a lot of money. Renting, you pass it on to your customers. And that seems like the best way to go for some. However, I just mentioned a situation where a client wanted a certain type of collar, but the people I buy them from or rent them from didn't have it. So maybe if I bought my own linens and I had them on hand, then I could take care of the client's demands a little bit easier. Now, of course, comes along with that is now I'm going to have to wash them dryer. They can fit those things. I'm going to steam them. Storage space, and there's always costs associated with storage. So a lot of issues come with that. Um, However, if I'm going to charge somebody or do linen for someone, I'm going to charge them. Uh, I can charge them $10 per linen. And if they're all mine, once I recoup my cost, it becomes pretty much mainly profit. Rather than charging somebody 10 bucks and having to give five of it to the linen company. So, there's that. Uh, next on the, the whole buffet, uh, we'll talk about room arrangements uh, and how we set up a buffet. Now, typically what you're going to see in a buffet, one big long line. Maybe people on one side of it, maybe people going on both sides of it, or double-sided. You're going to make that decision on how to do your buffet uh, based on a couple of things. One, how many people you're going to have. I like to put no more than 75 people through a buffet line. And depending on the group and the time, if it's lunch, I might drop that down to 50 people. Because you got to think, if it's 50 people and it takes everybody a minute to get through the line, which would be crazy fast, that's still an hour for the basically that last person to get through. So think about how many people you've got. Think about the, the time of day. Think about the type of event. Double-sided, you know, if you can do a double-sided buffet where people go through both sides of the line, is always a wonderful thing. The question comes next is how many buffet lines do you need? Once again, that might be dictated by the time of day, the type of group, the number of people you have, the space you have. Sometimes there's just no room for a second line uh, in a buffet setting. So you may have to adjust the choices at that point of the different items you're going to serve. Do you want people to come up and say, hmm, do I want this or do I want that? So if I'm going to have a whole lot of people and one little buffet line, I may say not do salad dressings aside on the table, but I will do a salad that's pre-dressed. In other words, it's got the dressing on it already. Now people don't come up and think, hmm, do I want ranch? Do I want Italian? 
salad's already pre-dressed, they scoop their salad and go. So menu design goes really hand in hand with setup. You might have people that want to do something special like a station buffet. And with a station buffet, we will have different areas set up around the room. All right. So in other words, people can come in and they can enjoy food from this person. Next person, they go to another corner and, and, and have something done there. We see this with pasta stations a lot. People can come up, they can get pasta here, they can go to this side and they get a salad toss like a Caesar salad. Um, stations are great. One of the best I think I've ever done was a grilled cheese station. Uh, the night before this event, I had done a cheese tasting event and I had a bunch of cheese left over. Cheese displays are great. Everybody loves them. They ooh and ah, but no one ever eats them. So you charge a bunch of money and you take home a bunch of cheese. Well, what I did in this case was I went and set up a couple of flat top electric griddles. I had all these different cheeses sliced. I had different breads. I had meats. I had different condiments and stuff. And I had people come up and to the grilled cheese stage and say, what type of grilled cheese would you like? And literally, you've got to pick your cheese, your condiments, bread, meat, whatever. And we made people little grilled cheeses. And it was a, a big hit for the party. So, stations are great. Once again, downsize the stations. Well, I've got to have a room. And I may not have the room for something like that. Another big one is I've got to have the right type of staff. I've got to have staff with the ability, with the talent, that they can actually stand there, converse with a, a client, and make the food the way they should, the same way every time. Um, you see this a lot in um, also in breakfast. Omelet stations. Everyone likes an omelet station. Years ago, I worked in a restaurant that I had to do an omelet station, and I could make four omelets at a time. I was quick on the omelets. My problem was I couldn't remember who got what omelet. So I'd be standing there with four almas trying to remember who ordered what. Not fun. Uh, it's always good to have people just stand there and wait on their food if they will. But stations are a way to really upscale what you're doing um, and, and show off a lot of culinary talent and do things that not everybody has done. So that's kind of um, the, the buffet setup. Setting up the room in general, once again, goes to the number of people we have, the space available, the flow, where people come in at, how they leave. Are the people going to come in and sit right down? Are the people going to come in and mingle? For example, fundraiser, you might want people to stand up and talk and walk around and mingle with each other. That conversation gets people you know, talking about the projects that so-and-so wants to do. We're talking about donating money. Then you start passing around butler past uh, hors d'oeuvres and some wine. Um, it really just depends on the situation. Uh, it's too bad there is not a, an exact science to this. So much of it is just learning and doing. But try to think about those things that would get in the way, things about those things that, you know, would impede uh, when you're trying to set up this banquet and also, you know, the wishes of your clients. There are times when you have to say, I'm sorry, but because of the size of the room, there is no way we can do what you want done. But you need to be able to come up with other options for it. All right. That is basically how we may serve you. Uh, please write with any questions. Have a good week. Thanks.